Hello everyone, and welcome to the start of my hashtag sponsored playthrough of Radical Dreamers via the Chrono Cross Radical Dreamers edition. Uh, I was the only person in my group chat to scream and be excited when it was uh, announced on stream. And as soon as it came up, I was like, oh cool, Chrono Cross. And then I saw Radical Dreamers edition. I was like, I really hope that means we're getting Radical Dreamers. And by George, they did it. This is the first, as far as I'm aware, port of a Satellaview game that has come out. For those of you who don't know, the Satellaview was a game add-on for the Super Nintendo that you, like, hooked your Super Nintendo up to satellites to get games broadcast to it. And if you downloaded Chrono Cross, well, sorry, if you downloaded Radical Dreamers, you got the sequel to Chrono Trigger. And if not, well, then that is it. So... I'm excited to hop in. Just as a heads up, there will be, because this is hashtag sponsored by Square Enix, thank you Square Enix for sending me the code, um, there will be every 20 minutes or so just a little pop-up saying, hey, thank you to Square Enix there. So we'll deal with that, and that will happen when I do get to my actual Chrono Cross playthrough. I love this art. That's really nice. I will get to my actual Chrono Cross playthrough later, but for now, we are starting off with Radical Dreamers, because that is sequentially the thing after... Oh! Wow. Sounds a little too churchy for me, though. Okay. Um, I, I don't... I, I'm, I'm good. Um, we're going to hop in with Radical Dreamers, because we, we finished Chrono Trigger. Now we're going on to the next thing that came out. This was a Super Nintendo game, right? You have to remember that. And uh, never available in English. There were ways to play it, but not the no, not not officially. Presented by the Radical Dreamers, 1996. So that's one year after Chrono Trigger. It all began with a notebook my mother handed me. She told me that she found it while cleaning the closet. Oh, and it's a visual novel, by the way. So if you're not into that, then uh, too bad, because I am. This old notebook, notebook covered with mold was a diary that belonged to my grandfather passed away many years ago. It contained his distant memories. if you still remember how we first met and our many adventures. This song sounds very familiar. It all seemed like a dream. We ran like the wind during those warm summer days long ago. You're a piece of star that fell from the sky. still relive the memories of those days long past. This is a very familiar song. Just by closing my eyes like so and whispering your name into the desolate night. Kid. Kid. So, is Kid the main character? I have very little knowledge. I only know the basic premise of this. And how this later got uh, included in Chrono Cross. As for how much I know, it's very little. Kid, is that a skull on the moon? Do you see that? Hey, kid. Looks like a skull. Are you ready, kid? I know you're anxious, but stay on your toes. Yeah, likewise, mate. You mess up and I'm leaving you behind. Got that, Surge? I'll get ready for that. They gave her the accent in this. Okay, that's good. Come on, Magil. Let's go. That bastard Lynx is going to get what he deserves. Say your prayers. Not that it'll do you any good. <laughs> Magil. I already know... The, 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 the little twisterino with Magil, so we'll uh, we'll hold on to that though till that gets revealed. Radical Dreamers, le trésor indertit is français. Chain selection, confirm menu, return to launcher, auto text, just menu, sound settings. Okay. Name. 
Uh, I'm going to stick with Surge. That's the name. The old, uh, the old lady's tip-off was right on the money. The counter spell on the barrier around the outer walls could have done a real number on us. Oh, oh my god, I apologize. This is going to be real hard to do. Kid's plain, unadored braid flickered back and forth across her shoulders as she walked. She's going to go between British and Australian very fast. We picked up our way through the elaborate lattice of the manor's magic shields, moving in closer and closer to Lord Lynx's stronghold. There were three of us. Kid, Magil, and me. I guess it must have been three years already since I met Kid. That's interesting. Back then I was just a wandering musician. That's also different. Traveling wherever my feet would take me, and wherever a few tunes would pay for a warm bed. It was in the Outlands, in a town called Rejor Regiora, Regioria, where we first ran across one another. And since then, she dragged me along a whole bunch of adventures and uh, misadventures, too. Ah, kid. She was a thief, and not just any thief. Just a few months shy of 17 and already renowned as one of the realm's greatest. What's more, she was achingly beautiful, stylish, and a joy to be around. And a dab? And at can't side cooking, or so she liked to claim. The truth was a little different. Those bandits with hearts of gold you heard about in stories, the ones who... Steal from the rich and give to the poor? Yeah, that wasn't Kid's style. She was short-tempered, prone to lying, bossy, and obsessed with money. And rarely did she care to listen to a single word anyone said to her. But she wasn't all that bad. Probably. Maybe. Sometimes she had her moments anyway. I glanced over my shoulder to see a shadow hovering behind us, blending into the darkness like smoke. Magil. Also known as Magil the Shade. He was Kid's partner, but even after three years, I still knew hardly anything about him. All I knew was that he was around 30 years old and not much of a talker, but he was one heck of a mage. I heard that he and Kid had started working together before I met her. He always covered the top half of his face with a mask, but and I've never seen what he looked like underneath. That should sound familiar to anyone who's played Chrono Cross, though you might be like, hey, wait, what? That's not his name. Yeah, I don't... I don't a hundred percent know why, other than this game didn't have an English translation, so they just made up a new name. He was a man so mysterious that it seemed like he was an interloper from another world. It wasn't like Kid was exactly big on details about her past, but Magil, he might as well not have had one. And Kid didn't seem to know much about her partner in crime either. What kind of man he was, what kind of life he'd lived before, nothing. You might ask how exactly I wound up being part of this merry band. Well, it's complicated. I guess you could say that life doesn't always turn out the way you think it will. Kid, who was heading up our little raiding party, suddenly stopped dead. Look lively, boys. We got company. Oh boy. We glanced around warily as cruel, cold eyes emerged from the darkness. That's spooky. I heard a low growl. Dark shadows prowled through the night surrounding us. A pack of wild cats. <laughs> They're dribbling basketballs and singing songs towards us. There must have been about ten of them. A thrill of fear ran down my spine. Flustered, I pulled my knife from my belt. Kid calmly shifted into a fighting stance. Watch yourselves, I don't reckon these buggers have been treated for rabies. The wildcats snarled and growled as they slowly closed in on us, drawing the noose tighter and tighter. Their eyes glinted in the darkness like fireflies, and... Strings of eager spittle dripped wetly to the ground. Then, one of them sent an almighty roar soaring to the moon, and the hunt was on. Oh my god, there's... Wait. Wait, this song comes from this? Oh god! Think fast, kid dived into the... Ca give oh my god, you, you... It's timed. It gave the largest of their number an almighty kick in the chops. The starved beast gave yelp as it was sent flying. I turned to my right to see a nearby wildcat was charging toward me. Its head lowered menacingly. Panic, I tried to make a last second dodge, but it wasn't quite fast enough. Is Okay, so wait, there's a menu, right? I can't do it right now. No, that's autoplay. I winced in pain and turned to face my foe redly. I struck at it wildly. I slashed a nearby wildcat with my knife. The beast tried to leap clear, but I was already too close. I thought the blade made contact and was rewarded with a screech of pain. The wildcat jumped away. This The time managing... Uh, this time managing to put some space between us. It looked like I hadn't cut it very deeply. Oh my god, I can't believe this song came from this. This is wild. 
I stood my ground, changing my grip on the knife and waiting for another chance to attack. Serge, behind you! Panicked by Kid's warning, I whirled wildly around and came face to face with a pair of eyes blazing like hellfire. I tried to... I defended myself. This wasn't time to do anything but to protect myself. In a moment of sheer desperation, I crossed my arms to guard my face. Instantly, I felt the wildcat's fang sink to my exposed wrist. It had thrown itself itself bodily at me, bowling me over backwards. Ah! My arms still in its powerful jaws, the wildcat pinned me to the ground and shook its head. I tried desperately to free myself, but it was like... It was clamped onto me like a bear trap. There was no way of getting loose. The sound of fang on bone was sickening. But just then, the creature recoiled with a screech. Kid had buried her knife deep in its gut. She quickly capitalized on its terror by giving it an almighty kick. Free of the wildcat, I staggered to my feet, holding the throbbing wound on my arm. I was breathing heavily. The handle of my knife was slick with sweat, and I tightened my grip. With a kick like a bolt of lightning, Kid landed a clean hit on the flank of a nearby cat, Wildcat. It staggered before losing its footing, letting out a pathetic cry. But Kid had already moved on in to finch it off. And then, the roar of fire. A burning smell filled my nostrils, and next to me, a shrill screech pierced the air. Magil's fire spell engulfed the head of a nearby wildcat. It fled, darting off into the darkness like an arrow. Well, that didn't go great. I scanned the area. Only moments ago we had been surrounded, but now, there wasn't a single wildcat left. Kid and Magil had either sent the rest of them off with their tails between their legs, or put paid to, or put paid to them once and for all. That's a phrase I've never heard. Ha! You're dreaming if you think a pack of flea-bitten moggies gonna stop us, Lynx. Kid crossed her arms and flashed a triumphant grin. Meanwhile, I was panting heavily and it felt like my legs were about to give out from under me. I collapsed to my knees, overwhelmed by what I've just been through. <sighs> I'd taken a few hits, but I was fine otherwise. A couple of scars to talk about later, maybe, but nothing that would stop me from carrying on. Are you hurt? Magil looked down at me, his face expressionless as ever. No worries, Madge. It'll be all right. <laughs> the accent's going everywhere, said Kid, barging in to take a better look at me. He may be a winging sook, but it'll be take more than a few scratches to kill this one. She was nothing if not sympathetic, but she was right. This was no time to be bemoaning my lot. We hadn't even reached the manor yet. I dabbed at my wounds with tincture-soaked cloth and wrapped them with bandages, then looked up at the other two. <laughs> I owe I'm out. No, we're just getting started. We're just getting started, I grinned back, putting on a brave face of things. Now that I know that there's a time limit, I gotta choose quickly. That's what I like to hear. Kid cheerily announced from close quarters. But then her eyes turned cold, like the cool glow of the moon in the night sky. It's gonna be a long night. I nodded, trying my hardest not to utterly lose myself in her pale blue eyes. Alright, let's get this show back on the road. She turned away and marched off deeper into the trees without looking back to see if me and Magil were following her. Magil, of course, was already right behind her, his unhurried gait making it seem as though nothing much had happened at all. I jumped back to my feet to chase after them. I'd be in for even more trouble than I'd bargained for if I got separated from them. That seems like foreshadowing. The dark forest inside the manor's perimeter seemed to go on forever. A labyrinth of trees and boulders. I should check. Okay, so the X button does open up the menu. Which does let me save. Put a bookmark. Oh, we gotta go surround sound. Yeah, wow, that sounds so much better. That sounds great. Wow, it's really good with headphones on, actually. This is mostly for me, but... The manor itself loomed in the distance, glowering over the vast grounds. And hidden within was a veritable mountain of treasure just waiting for us. Lord Lynx was the noble who ruled the remote territory of Regoria. Re Regiora? I don't know. He was also Kid's mortal enemy. We were there that night to steal a certain jewel he kept locked away in his most closely guarded vault, the Frozen Flame. The Frozen Va Flame was veiled in mystery. It was said to be imbued with an uncanny energy and possessed of a beauty and clarity that made it a priceless treasure. I should note... Chrono Cross is another game that, like, I played a lot as a kid and learned certain, you know, um, things of, but my knowledge of it, like, of actually playing it is nil, right? So I will be playing Chrono Cross, but, like, I know what the Frozen Flame is already. Countless thieves had tried to steal it, 
and not one of them had come close to succeeding. Nor had any of them escaped the manor alive. And now it was our turn to try and sneak into this place of death. Led by a girl who had the ambition to make the impossible possible, a hunger for vengeance that drove her onward, and a desire for riches that could never be satisfied. As we pressed on through the tree-filled darkness, the shadows gave way at last, revealing the true extent of the vast mansion. Oh yeah. Yeah, that's uh, that's, that's, that's a manor, all right. Heh, <laughs> finally, say your prayers, Lynx, cause we're coming for ya. Keeping to the overgrowth and the shadows of the trees, we made our way around the manor walls in search of a means of entry. Eventually, we came to a terrace overlooking the garden. There was no sign of any guards nearby. The only thing surrounding the manor was an uncanny stillness. This will lead us right into the straight into the west wing. Just as well, we don't have any business in the rest of the manor tonight, said Magil, gazing up at the dark building towering over us in the night. All right, yeah, what are we waiting for? With that, Kid made to the vault. It's made to vault over the railing of the terrace. Stop! Magil hissed sharply. Remember what we're here for. Our main target is the vault and the frozen flame within it. We focus on this above all else. Your vengeance is of secondary concern. Agreed? Glancing over his shoulder, Kid replied with reluctant, Yeah, yeah, don't get your knickers in a twist. But if we happen to run into him, I'm gonna knock that Drago's block off, and neither you or anybody else is gonna stop me. <laughs> I guess Kid was gonna get her way whether we liked it or not. Let's go, boys. Night is young. She cleared the railing with a sprightly hop and vanished inside the manor. I glanced toward Magil and nodded in silence. We followed Kid's lead and we were soon inside Lord Lynx's lair. The darkness swallowed us whole. Alright, we're in? Are we in-in? I definitely remember getting stuck outside the manor in uh, Chrono Cross itself. The corridor stretched off to the left and right. It's equally dark and chilly in both directions. Well, we said we need to go to the west wing, right? Or the east, yeah, the west wing. So west would be to the right. I, maybe. Actually, I don't know what direction we came from. We pressed on through the darkness, down corridors that twisted and turned snake-like this way and that. Everything around us was still and silent and it felt strange like we were being watched. It was as if countless eyes were staring from the shadows, looking on with curiosity and pity. We continued, creeping cautiously down the corridors, Kid moved proudly and stealthily like a cat stalking its prey while in the shadows. Magil followed. the sinister breeze. We pressed on into the embrace of the Weaver of Fate. The what now? What is that? A short way along the corridor running from the right-hand side of the terrace, we found an ancient-looking door again on our right. Kid pressed an ear against it, looking for any signs of life. Dead quiet. Don't reckon there's anybody in there. Well, let's go in. In we go. He had stilled her breath and reached for the handle. The door wasn't locked. It swung open slowly. Oh, that kind of made me jump. Slightly. What's this room supposed to be? Place is a dump. Kid had poked her head in through the door, taking a quick peek to see if there was anyone else inside. I was disappointed by what she found. The room was large and littered with peculiar machinery and knickknacks all of which were covered in dust and had seemingly been placed there haphazardly. Everything looked like it had been rusting for a very long time. The ends of the room were completely dark and it was impossible to tell just how big it was or even what the walls and floor looked like. It seemed the manor's inhabitants had turned the old clock tower into a makeshift storage space some time ago. I stepped warily inside. Leave that alone. I looked over toward Magil and saw a Kid trying to pull something from the shadows. It was a huge sword that appeared to be very old indeed. You don't need that old bludgeon, it'll only get in the way. And as much of an antique as it is, it won't fetch much on the market in that condition. Yeah, I reckon it might, you know. There's plenty of collectors who just love old bits of junk. Well, some old bits of junk. Pouting, Kid left the sword where she stood. At least, she put it down gently. It was then we heard a voice from the shadows. What exactly are you doing here, hmm? I just about jumped out of my skin. Who's there? 
Kid and Magil turn the face of the voice, ready for a fight. Ow! A wizened crone emerged from the shadow. She was hunched over and wore a hood draped over her face. I could tell at a glance that she wasn't just old, she was positively ancient. It's some old dodgery old bag. What do you think you're doing sneaking up on us like that? Kid's shoulders relaxed as the tension left her body. Magil, however, continued to give the woman a piercing stare. Oh-ho! What an impish thing, little thing you are, here to visit a friend, perhaps. Not in the dead of night, I suspect. The crone narrowed her eyes. Let's get a closer look at you. Ah, yes, you must be here to get your revenge on Lynx. How did she... My heart jumped. She seemed to know exactly who we were. We were in trouble. What if she sounded the alarm? We have to give up on the treasure and run for our lives. What do we do? Definitely tell her she was right, play dumb, pretend we didn't hear her. We gotta play dumb. What's that? Don't know what you're on about, lady. Kid did her best to play dumb. And she did it well. Mind you, she'd never feel much shame about lying or deceit. Never felt, rather. I said... Nope. I said, can you believe anyone would be so foolish? Or oh, is that hers? No. I said, can you believe it and would be so foolish to challenge great little Lynx? They'd have to be right out of their mind. Ho, ho, ho. Ho, ho, but... Seriously, girl, you can't fool me, so don't try. A sense of sudden steeliness in her voice. At least I was pretty sure I did. <laughs> we continue to play dumb. Who's trying to fool you? Please. I'd never dream of laying a finger on Lord Lynx. I mean, he's so handsome. You bonkers, lady. Is this some kind of sick joke? Kid did her best to lie her way out of the crone's line of questioning, but I couldn't see how awkward it was for her to even say Lord Lynx little and handsome. So be it. I have little time to spend in the company of liars, spat, spat the crone. With that, her body slowly floated off the ground and then vanished into thin air. Hey, where'd you go? We scanned the room, but she was nowhere to be found. Kid looked like she'd just woken up on the floor of the Laughing Pig after a few too many. I was feeling pretty disoriented myself. We won't find any answers here. Time to move on. Magil brought us back down to Earth, emotionless as always. Seemed as though he thought nothing had happened at all. With that, we left the room, but I couldn't help wondering who that old woman might could have been. Huh. The door led back to the corridor, which stretched off to the left and right. Rightward lay the depths of the mansion, while the left led back to the terrace. So we want to go to the right, to the depths of the mansion. Continuing on our way down the corridor, we came across a rather sturdy-looking door on the left. A little further on stood a stairway leading upward. Oh, this door's clearly meant to be keeping something safe. If there ain't some kind of treasure behind it, me name ain't Kid. <laughs> yep, that's the smell of cold hard cash, all right. All right, I trust her instincts. Let's go. Oh, what am I stupid? Of course it's bloody locked. Kid had tried the door handle a few times before giving it a grumpy kick. Bloody door's got a magical berry on it to boot. And the bloody berry has got a berry of its own to boot. It'll take more of me and putting the boot in through to get... Well, I said boot many times. To get through all that? I see. Then unless we find the key, we don't have a hope of getting inside. Reckon I can handle a key hunt, especially if it's that idiot Lynx who's hiding, hidden it. You can search his room. I'll sniff it out in two seconds flat. You just watch. There was little else we could do. So we decided, look, we continue on. The corridor ended at the foot of some stairs. With Kid in the lead, we headed up upwards. It was dark and the stairway was narrow. We watched our footing carefully as we climbed. The stone on the steps was worn smooth with age, and I lost count of how many there were as we spiraled onward and upward. An awful sense of foreboding haunted me. I had no idea why, but it felt as though we were marching to the gallows. When we arrived at the top of the stairs, we were greeted by an old heavy door looming in the silence. All was deathly silent, and the still, clammy air added to the sense of ominous apprehension. Something's very wrong. I muttered without thinking. I can hear cursed whispers from beyond the door. Magil added, doing nothing to lift the mood. Ah, grow up, will ya? Kid shouted back at us, derisively. She was already examining the door. Oh, it ain't locked. Don't hear anyone inside. Well, let's go inside. All right, here goes. Kid tried the handle. The door opened with a slow, heavy swing revealed what lay beyond. Ooh, that, that makes me jump every time. It was a small, cylindrical room that appeared to be the inside of one of the stone towers. Completely deserted and there were no windows. What's this supposed to be? Something about this place gives me the creeps. Standing in the doorway, Kid suddenly seemed taken aback. 
There might be something in here. Let's take a closer look. A closer look at a bloody empty room? Pfft. Might as well, I guess so. Did climb all them stairs. It stepped through the door, grumbling under her breath. I scanned the room, then noticed something on the floor. The flagstones were covered in dozens of narrow scratches in place, as there were thick black stains. Something in the stains spoke of a horror that no amount of scrubbing would ever wash away. A malice and a sadness beyond imagining. Something written here. Crouching in front of a wall, Magil was expecting some brownish markings that looked like more of the same stains. Magil, that's poop! Some's carved letters into won't, scrambling them all up using... Blood magic? Could have gone over to take a look. Looks pretty old. Hard to read, too. Some of it's been worn away. Let's see. I not hold out much longer. My only hope now is to leave the Acacian Signet in this room. Acacian Signet? Suddenly, the door slams shut. We jump to our feet with a start. Uh-oh! From above us, we heard an unsettling creaking sound. The floors and the wall and floors began to tremble. What the hell's going on? Kid's eyes dart around the room as she desperately tried to figure out what was happening. The creaking sound from above continued, and the ceiling moved ominously closer. Oh, this is the battle. This is the boss theme, too. Up there. Oh, come on. Of course. Oh, mode 7. Are we just screwed? We walk right into a bloody trap, Kid Bitter Lip. We gotta do something fast. Um... We have to try to stop the ceiling. Right, we need to stop the ceiling, okay, but how? I have no idea. Is there a hidden switch somewhere? Panic, we brush our hands against the floor and we'll see if anything had escaped our notice. Ah, oh, one of the descending blades stabbed into my shoulder. We do something in fast. Barge the door down. That kid sprang at the door like an arrow, slamming its shoulder first, but it was far too heavy. Light frame brown off her, damn it! Magil raced toward the door like the wind, smashing it into it with ferocious force, it made a creaking sound shook from impact, but stood firm. Desperately, I hurled myself at it too. <clears throat> the shock of the impact rushed through my body, but it was no good. Meanwhile, the rusty creaking continued, as did the ceiling's inexorable journey downward. To make matters worse, now countless blades were popping in and out. Surge Magil, this is going to take the three of us. Timing our blows, we all charged the door at once. Once, twice, a third time. And then the door was open, and we were collapsed in a heap in the corridor outside. Huh. Behind us, we heard the sound of the bladed ceiling grinding on the stone floor of the tower room. The metallic scraping noise it made was awful. We could only look on in silent horror at the fate we'd so narrowly evaded. Can we look back in and see if there's something above it? Yeah. Machinery continued for a short while before slowly coming to a stop. It seemed the ceiling trap had finally finished its grisly work. Bugger me! Talk about nasty surprise! Is it some sort of execution chamber? Magil continued deep in thought. In any case, the writing mentioned Acacia. Now, what was that all about, I asked. The Acacia Dragoons, the elite knightly order serving General Viper, who once governed the territory of Galesburg to the west. Former knightly order, I should add. They were wiped out more than a decade ago by the lord of this very manor, Lord Less. Ooh, okay. Uh, thanks for the history lesson, Madge. Uh, kid rose to her feet, panting off the dust. Too bad we're not here for fairy tale nights. Come on, we got a lot more exploring left to do. Magil shrugged silently as we headed back to the stairs. Can't we look back in there and check? Nope. With the kid in lead, we headed downstairs. And downstairs, continued on straight, came across a sturdy looking door on our right. Yeah, we can't do anything with that one. Okay, so we want to go continued on toward back toward the terrace. Door to our left, we went there. That's the old woman room. Continue on. Uh, the terrace came into view. We kept walking. We want to uh, keep following the corridor. We took the corridor, leading from the left-hand side of the terrace, eventually into an intersection with some stairs. The path to the right led to some stairs. The path to the left was a dark passage. The main corridor continued on. Well, let's um, went into the, let's go to the side passage to the left. We went down the side passage. At the end of it came to an old, immaculately polished door. Well, that's polished. Let's go inside. Kid gently pushed the door ajar and peeked into the room. Next thing I knew, she'd slipped inside. Magil and I followed. Looks like a study. The room was lit by the moonlight coming through the long, slender windows, slanting down in pale beams through the darkness. Oh, yeah. It's pretty big for a study with immaculate antique desk dominating the center. There were rows of bookshelves lined with thick, dusty old tomes. 
The wall to the rear of the room was decorated with paintings, and shelves of vases and painted plates stood before it. They all seemed to be curios from foreign lands. Desk first, obviously. I went over to the desk and started searching the drawers. There I found a neatly arranged set of pens, ink bottles, and other writing materials. Nothing of interest, in other words. A small portrait on the desk caught my eye. It was a picture of a young girl with a gentle smile on her lips. Who was she? That's intriguing. Huh. That's the girl Lynx adopted. You ask me, it ain't cause he was looking to help the needy, said Kid peering over my shoulder. She wrinkled her nose in distaste. Not even a looker. Suddenly there was a knock at the door. It wasn't a loud knock, but in the bottomless silence of the night, it might as well have been a thunderclap. Kid and I stood bolt upright and turned toward it. Magil, meanwhile, hid in the shadows, drifting away like smoke. Panicked, I whispered to Kid. Hide behind the door in the shadows. Quick, get behind the door. We kept our bodies low and we silently and swiftly made to the back of the door where the shadows would keep us hidden. We pressed our backs to the wall and did our best to still our breathing. Slowly, the door opened. Flickering candlelight spread from the doorway with a warm glow. I held my breath. But it seemed that whoever it was didn't mean to come in. They simply stood there. Strange. Thought I heard something. But the lord of the manor is away, of course. Why would there be anyone in here? I have to get over my nerves. Everything was fine until we heard the news that poor was on the move. Oh, <laughs> remember what we heard. Remember what we heard from the bonus ending of Chrono Trigger. Right? Dalton said, I'm going to raise an army in poor. The figure quick, quietly closed the door, plunging the room back into darkness. The voice trailed off to a whisper. We remained motionless, keeping our ears pricked for any sign of an unwelcome return. All we heard were footsteps moving away. So poor has made its move. Magil emerged from the shadows, contemplating the news we'd overheard. Kid... If the rumors are true, we might, uh, we might well be able to find ourselves in a very difficult situation. This seemed to be her thinking too, or set her thinking too. Poor was a powerful nation that ruled the southern continent. That's so wild. I'd heard it was a prosperous land whose recent and sudden development had pushed it far ahead of its neighbors, which made me wonder, what would its inhabitants want here out in the sticks? They couldn't be after the frozen flame too, could they? Mm, it would make sense. As valuable as it might be a jewel, it's just a jewel in the grand scheme of things. I couldn't imagine it being an item of national interest. I mean, ultimately, it was just a pretty rock, right? Ugh, let them do what they want. If everyone's busy playing soldiers, they won't be bothering us. Come on, we've got things to do. She headed for the door. We left the room and made our way back down the side passage. And we can't look at the other stuff? Okay. We made our way back eventually, we arrived at the intersection. So let's go down the stairs this time, right? Let's go down the stairs. Slowly, we crept down the staircase, descending deeper into blackness as we went. At the bottom, the class split. The way to the left continued onto an atrium that was some sort of plausible. The right was a dis... Ooh. Let's go towards the atrium to the left. Kid poked her head through the arch-shaped door and took a look in. Oh, it's big in here. Must be some kind of all. We took a cautious look around, then entered one after another. Well, that's... pre-rendered. <laughs> the atrium was like a beautiful plaza, complete with a statue that doubled as a fountain. Pillars and arches lined the walls, and in the center was a small pool of clear water above which the statue stood. On the other side of the room, I could see the arched entrance like the one we had come through. That's going to come to life. Well, that's cold. Kid was scooping up water from the fountain. I went over to her and, resting my hand on the edge of the marble basin, peered into the pool beneath. Shadows flickered under the water's surface. I reckon those fish are rare, as in valuable. Kid leaned right over the edge. I couldn't see the bottom. I wondered how deep it was. The shadow of one of the fish grew larger and larger. Whoa! Sensing danger, Kid leapt back from the edge. Clack! A fish leapt out of the water and snapped at her, its jaws bristling with razor-sharp teeth. Its mouth closed shut on the air where she'd only been moments before, with a splash, the fish darted back under the water. Pyranodons! Deadly, carnivorous fish with razor-sharp teeth and powerful jaws that could snap a monster's horn in half. Staring in horror, I watched as dark shadows began to gather in what little of the pool I could make out. The Pyranodons must have sent detected prey. Soon, the room was filled with the sound of splashing and snapping as the fish teemed at the water's surface. Bloody hell! 
Kid was uneasy. She took another step back. How many pteranodons were in the pool? The thought of what would happen if they all leapt clear of the water and attacked at once crossed my mind. A bead of cold sweat rolled down my forehead. Oh, come on. Suddenly, the water coming from the jet turned crimson and shot out a powerful jet that nearly touched the ceiling. Kid jumped back. I stood in shock, watching the torrent of water erupting from the statue. The scarlet waters continued to gush out of the fountain. The pool grew redder and redder and started to overflow. We looked on in trance, but the soon the spell was broken once we realized the water was starting to flow faster and faster over the rim of the basin. The pteranodons began to jump and snap at the water surface with bloodthirsty glee. I was brought to my senses by the dull slapping of pteranodons. Uh, we rushed the exit. Put the exit on the other side, I pointed the, oh, I pointed the door opposite where we came. I tried my hardest to rush across the red pool, sending out great gouts of crimson water, but it was thick as blood and I found myself struggling to move. I felt sharp pains of jabbing, sharp jabs of searing pain as countless pteranodons snapped at my legs. Kid gritted her teeth in pain. Church, we gotta do something for mincemeat. What's it gonna do? I deal with the fish. What? You won't try and pick these stole off one by one? Kid glared at me in disbelief, her face a picture of exasperated disbelief. Don't believe, buddy idiot, Serge, you won't die here? While well, I stood there, my mouth agape, a pterodon sank its teeth into my foot. A jolt of pain surged my, up my leg, making me jump. Okay, well, we gotta rush back the way we came. Let's get out of here! In a panic, we splashed through the water back to the corridor where we came from. They snapped on my legs and felt a searing pain, but I had to endure it if I had any hopes of reaching the entrance. Breathing heavily, I finally found myself back in the corridor outside. Oh man, I got hit like three times. I hope this doesn't have like a secret HP meter. Oh, that was a close call. That old thing was a trap, eh? Talk about Twisted Lynx is even more of a sick bastard than I thought. I was about to say that he wouldn't have to be if we didn't have to, er, I, I was about- Oh, I was about to say he wouldn't have to be if he didn't have to guard against people like her breaking into his home, but I thought better of it. Well, at any rate, I think we can consider this a dead end. Let's go back. Defeated, we left the atrium. Okay, don't go to the atrium. Sounds good. Something caused Kid to stop in her tracks. Hello, hello, what we got here? She pointed to the side of the entranceway to the hall. I found myself face to face with a sculpture of an old man's face with a truly phenomenal beard. That's yup. The sculpture's eyes seemed to gleam with life. For a piece of marble, it seemed almost too realistic. It's a mouth of truth, announced Magil. Oh, these suck! You put in your hand, and then if it bites it, you're lying. An enchanted statue that can tell when you're lying. If it catches you, it'll bite your hand off. Magil kept his explanation simple so that kid couldn't drift off before he got to the important part. Ah, so what's it doing here, then? It's a part of a greater mechanism. Stick your hand in its gob, do ya? Right, yo, let's see what happens with it, shall we? The mischievous glint in her eye, Kid darted over and stuck her hand in its mouth without a moment's hesitation. She stood there for a moment, waiting, but it didn't take long for her to get bored. Eh, nothing. Suddenly, I had an idea. Hey, Kid, who's the greatest thief who ever lived? Ha! <laughs> Me, of course, you drog, drong. Kid answered without a moment's hesitation, then suddenly her face twisted with pain. The teeth of the marble statue had clamped down on her- Oh, it bit me, she cried. Knock it off, everyone knows it's a sh- Ow! The sculpture bit her again as soon as she spoke. Oh, you little dog. A cold sweat formed on Kid's forehead. The sculpture was tightening its grip. I won't let you go until you say something true. Despite the obvious urgency of the situation, Magil was as matter-of-fact as ever. Just say anything, Kid, anything, as long as it's the truth. Obviously, Kid wasn't listening. Instead, she kicked awkwardly at the statue. Oi, Beardy, let go of me bloody hand. She planted her feet to either side of his mouth and tried her hardest to pull out. She heaved, kicked, and stamped, grunted, and strained. And then finally her hand popped free. I was taken aback by what I just witnessed and couldn't say a word. See? Told you it was the truth. Kid raised her hand in the air triumphantly as if to demonstrate I could see heavy bite marks. The sculpture hadn't come away from the struggle and scathed either. Kid's attempt to break free had left it cracked in several places. Magil pointed silently at part of it. I went to take a closer look and saw a pale, flesh-colored tongue. I expect we're supposed to put something there, commented Magil. Serge's like, not me. I'm not doing it. I don't know what your plan is, but I'm not doing it. Something. What exactly? Kid stood there for a moment, lost in thought, and then she started to unload all the knickknacks she'd been carrying. A strange collection of odds and ends pulled out from her pockets, her boots, and even from her braid. All right, Serge, now it's your turn to have a go with that stupid statue. 
Kid grinned at me, holding her assortment of knickknacks out of the palms of both hands. I guess she decided that whatever further horrors the statue had in store, she'd rather not face them herself. Nice kid, real nice. Scrambling to myself, I reached out to pick an item. I chose... Mirror File Centipede... Oh my god. Petard? Underwear? Let's put it in his mouth. I picked up the sizable petard. Right? Is that what an underwear is? Because if you're hoist by your own petard, right? I'm googling what a petard is. Petard is... Oh! No, it's a small bomb! Oh, I heard the phrase hoist by your own petard, and I thought petard was clothing, so it's like, oh, I got pulled up. But no, that's a bomb. Uh-oh! Anxiously, I shoved it inside the mouth of the truth, but nothing happened. Let the professionals handle this, Serge. Kid pushed me aside. She was holding a match. Wait a second, you can't be serious. All the blood drained from my face. Deadly serious, mate. Before I could say another word, Kid lit the fuse. I thought we were putting, like, underwear in his mouth. An explosion followed, accompanied by a puff of white smoke. When the smoke was cleared, the mouth of truth came into view, still intact, but now very badly cracked indeed. Huh. Not enough oomph to knock its block off, eh? Should have brought a bigger one. Oh, now, now this is a petard. Kid stood there with her arms folded, calmly commenting on the mayhem she just caused. What do you think you're doing? I can't just believe you set that thing off like that. Kid shot a look at me. What do you mean? What's he gonna do with a bomb? I didn't know it was a bomb. She was completely on her liability. Well, any more ideas, Serge? Asked Kid breezily. I chose... Why do you have a centipede? Put a centipede in it. Oh, that is... What are you doing walking around with a centipede in your pockets? I reeled back in disgust. This isn't your pet or something, is it? I don't be thick, Serge. It's a toy, not pet. Toy? You could have picked something nicer. It is nice. Nice for giving people nasty surprises. <laughs> She seemed to think this was an entirely reasonable attitude. Entirely reasonable to her, maybe. What was she doing with all this stuff? I reached for the rubber centipede. Trying not to think too hard about what I was doing, I stuck it in the mouth of truth. Only for it to fall down the back of its throat. Sedge, you'll pay for this. Ground kid staring daggers at me. <laughs> Yikes! I'll get it back, I promise. Sealing my nerve, I reached into the mouth of truth. Suddenly, the hair stood on end. My hair stood on end. It was licking my hand. The giant, uncanny tongue slopped back and forth across my fingers like it was a lollipop. <laughs> I'm gonna puke. Keep it together, Serge. Do it for the centipede. Kid support didn't do much to help me, but I somehow managed to pin the centipede with the tips of my fingers and pull it out. You must really love this thing. I don't really. I just hate to see stuff go to waste. Sorry, what? Why did I even bothered? Okay. <laughs> well, no luck either. Won't try something else. Asked Kid almost like it was a game. So let this be over with. I reached for the next item and chose. Let's give him big ol' lips. Give him big ol' lips. I pick up a small lacquered tube of lipstick, and without knowing why, I smeared it across the statue's mouth. What are you? Me lippy! She wears lipsticks? Kid exploded with fury at the sight of the mouth of Truth's bright red lips. What are you getting so mad at? You don't even wear makeup. It's for marking a path to make sure we don't get lost. Huh! I didn't realize. Guess I'll explain why I brought it with you. What exactly is that supposed to mean? What's so funny about me having lipstick anyhow? Ugh. Nothing at all. It didn't take much to tell this was the calm before the storm. You better buy me some more when we're done here. Yep, she was mad alright. Okay, okay, I'm sorry. Let's just try something else. You gave me a doubting glare in response to my apology. Take this seriously or I'm throw with you. I gulped and nodded in panic. They reached for the next item I chose. This is fun. I just like this. Let's give him some, let's give him some raisins. I took a small bag of dried grapes. One by one, I fed them into the sculpture's marbled maw. Mm -hmm. Oh, I actually ate them. That's enough, Serge, as my emergency rations you're wasting. Kid snatched the bag from my hands. I saw the last grape, though, so I popped it in my mouth. It was absolutely delicious. That looked like I healed. Not for you either, sunshine, growled Kid, glaring at me. Go take this seriously, Serge. Shall I leave you alone here with Beardy? She was clearly annoyed. But I hadn't worn her patience completely thin just yet. <laughs> okay. Let's go with... Oh, this scroll is curious to me. I pick up a peculiar piece of parchment. Bracing myself, I shoved it into the mouth of truth. <laughs> nice one, Mr. Master Thief. You think it's a magic scroll or something? Kid doubled over with laughter. 
Guess that didn't work. With a sheepish chuckle, I pulled... Oh, is that like when ninjas put the scroll in their mouth? I pulled it out again. Oops, my hand slipped and the scroll unfurled. It's filled with strange symbols. Noticing the confused look on my face, Magil spoke up. It's a decoding chart used for the Imperial Guard's field reports. Ah, well, it's all gibberish to me. Wouldn't be much of a code if it wasn't, would it? Kid muttered witheringly. I was too embarrassed to reply. Once I claw back some of my pride, I attempted recovery. I'll have to walk me through it sometime. She just pouted and looked away. Oh, so you can't read it either. Boy, can I pick up my moments. <sighs> Fine, if we're not going to take this seriously, we're leaving you behind. Oh, well, that was her. Sometimes she was just cold as ice. I'd really done it now. She made to leave, but I grabbed her gently by the shoulder. Look, I'm not messing around. I'm sure this next idea is going to work. I believe it when I bloody well see it. Kid didn't seem convinced. Stakes were high. I looked at her collection of knickknacks and chose... Maybe the mirror? No, that doesn't make sense. The file? Maybe the thread. Maybe we can reach in and grab something. I took a piece of thread. A length of very finely spurned silk. Didn't seem like a good idea to just shove it in, so I tried dangling it into the statue's mouth. Watch yourself, that stuff ain't cheap. It's made by royal silkworms, I'll have you know. It watched me critically. The thread slipped deeper and deeper in the mouth of truth. Then I felt a slight tug. I tried winding it carefully back around my finger. At the end of it was a small piece of paper. Nice one, Serge! It's got a big clue. Kid's eyes lit up with delight. The note says try again. <laughs> he stood in stunned silence. You licky, tricky piece of- ah! Kid ripped up the piece of paper in a rage and threw it away and started kicking the mouth of truth. Magic was leaning against the wall, watching the spectacle in silence. <sighs> I'm guessing that one wasn't the one. Then what next? I chose... I guess the file. Took the file and placed it on the mouth of the marble statue. It didn't seem to be right at him for the job. Crunch, crunch, crunch. I was stunned. The mouth of truth had started chewing on the file. It was eating it. Ah! Kid screamed with rage. Me file! Me lovely, scratchy, scrappy file! Can't believe you just let that happen, crunch. You're in big trouble now, mate. She was clenching her fists and trembling with fury. Sorry, I'll get you another, I promise. Also want to add, just don't hit me, but thought better of it. I'll hold you to that, Kid muttered in a threatening grumble. She's gonna feed the statue on me stuff, we're done here. I promise that's not what I'm trying to do. You better bloody not be, mate. Once again, she had showed me her collect- Okay, we have the mirror, and that's it. Is it literally the mirror? I took the small silver mirror. The sculpture stared impassively, its marble beard still commanding my attention. I stuffed the mirror into its mouth. It didn't seem to be the right item for the job. <laughs> Don't see any cavities. Yeah, yeah, very funny. Now give me back me favorite Mia before that thing... Before that thing chops it to pieces. She lost her patience and snatched it from me. It's a rather nice mirror. Pictured her gazing into it as she braided her hair. Do you want to try something else? Asked Magil dry. Okay, so none of these, huh? None of these. I don't know what time to waste. I lingered for a moment, but pulled my hand away. Didn't seem like any of them was what we were looking for. All right, I just forget about it for now. Muttered kids, stowing all, all her valuables. So we're going to get an item, obviously, for that. I was sure we'd find a use for this stuff. Whatever, best get moving, eh? Defeated, we left the atrium behind us. And none, none of that meant anything, but that was a lot of fun. Leaving the atrium behind, we immediately found ourselves at a fork in the path. To the right was a passage going upward, a dark passageway continued on for ahead of where we stood. Well, let's go down the path. We left the atrium and continued on the path ahead. Eventually, we came across an ornate door on the right-hand side. That looks nice. Something smelled fresh and pleasant. Flowers. Was that coming from inside? Well, let's go inside. I like flowers. It's definitely not a trap. There's no way. We found ourselves in a tidy, welcoming room. Is this Lynx's room? The knickknacks and curios around the place seemed to be well-loved. The stately desk and cozy-looking bed nearby, meanwhile, suggested the room's occupant was no strange luxury. Though the room was richly furnished, somehow it felt awfully lonely. Kid took a quick look around before commenting. It's Lynx's girl's room. A half-written letter on the desk in a teacup still warm, suggesting that the lady of the manor was still nearby. It didn't seem that anyone was here now. We decided to search the room. Okay, that, that scared me. Some charming flowers, a discarded cotton hand, hand, uh, handkerchief, small bottle of perfume. Nothing that pr uh, meant particularly much to me. This is making me scared, nor anything that seemed particularly valuable. 
Kids seem to have the same impression and scan the room, clearly not expecting to find anything. The only item of note was a small antique box which bore a crest resembling a viper. I decided where to look next. Check the undies. I slipped open one of the finely veneered drawers. Frills, lace, and sequins greeted me in red, pinks, and yellows in a host of vivid colors. A bounty of beautiful silk garments overflowed from within. Tresses, eh? Give us, give us a look. It had been, uh, I'd been just about to close the drawer again when Kid came up and started peering over my shoulder. She reached out a hand to touch them, though I sensed a certain hesitation. I have never worn anything this posh in me life. The gown she picked up was cut s simply but beautifully and was decorated with a pale floral pattern on white background. She held it up to her chest and took a gentle twirl around the room. She was as light on her feet as a wood-limbed nymph. The fabric fluttered like flower petals, and she just held the helm just so. In that brief moment, you could have almost called her dainty. That <laughs> stupid thing, not exactly me, eh? I wouldn't say that thing really suits you. Oh, shut your gulp, ass kisser. Her face turned an angry red. Come on, we ain't got all night. The spell well and truly broken when she stomped out of the room. Uh, maybe there's something else in here, though. We should go... Okay. Uh, if we go back to the atrium with the fountain... Well, we'll go there on the way back, I guess. But you finding ourselves at a sturdy-looking, immaculately polished door. Yes, I thought something stinks here. I reckon we found the beast layer, lads. Okay, I'm gonna go back to that other room. Okay, let's go back to the other room. We retraced our steps, came across an ornate door. Oh, Riddell! Oh, okay. Interesting. Let's go inside again. Interesting, I didn't know it was Riddell's room. Okay, knickknacks and curios seem to be well-loved. Okay, let's go to the other one there. Half-written letter, teacup. Much-needed fresh air. Oh, that's a feather or a leaf. Seemed that someone had been here only moments ago. Let's come back later. We left it for now. Okay. Left and right. Okay, let's go deeper into the darkness. Okay. It stopped in her tracks, signaling to us with a hand behind her back. She drew a knife and stared into the darkness. We heard the clinking of metal up ahead. Goblin guards. It was unlikely there would be anything else going for a nighttime stroll around the mansion manor wearing armor. We got a fight. I drew my knife and ready myself. Picked up the situation pretty quickly and drew my knife preparing for a fight. Kid gave me a sideways glance. You know something? You're starting to look like a real thief. I just need to walk the walk, she grinned. All right, Serge, Magil, let's get him. Kid left forward confident as ever. It was as if she thought nothing could go wrong. That's a goblin. There are five in total. They weren't ordinary goblins. Having been looked after well in this palatial manner, they'd grown to be even larger than Magil. Each one was carrying the Manor Goblin's trademark, a morning star consisting of a rod and a heavy spiked iron ball on the chain. Wait, is it a flail? Mike can never remember. I didn't have time to think much more about it. Goblin came rushing at me. Uh, you knife, I'm faster. I held up my knife in front of me in an attempt to parry the attack somehow. Suddenly, the goblin disappeared. I looked inside to see a bird in the wall, arms and legs akimbo. Did you really expect to stop a morning star with only a knife? Your stupidity will get you killed shouted Magil, turning to face down two more of the goblins. I grabbed the fallen weapon and prepared to finish it off. I grabbed the morning star with both hands and swung down with all my might. Wham! The dull thud as the iron ball crashed in the goblin's helmet. I won't be getting up anytime soon. I looked at Kid. Kid was squaring off against two of the goblins. Their dull lumbering attacks couldn't reach her as she deftly sidestepped each and every one, striking back nimbly with a knife held in both hands. That was Kid's style. Float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. But stings make for tough going against enemies that can really take a beating. Both goblins were covered in cuts, but their attacks were as powerful as ever. I rushed in to help Kid deal with one of them. The enemy hadn't noticed me net. I took my time and chose my target. I tackled with the Morning Star I picked up. I gripped the Morning Star both, with both hands and swung with all the strength I could summon. Wham! There was a dull thud as the uh, spiked iron ball crashed in the goblin's helmet. It should have knocked the creature clean out, but it was still standing. The goblin turned around, its own morning star dangling from its hand. Its eyes were twitching madly. I'm in for it now, I thought. But then the pupils rolled in the back of its head and it crashed lifelessly to the floor. Whew. I breathed a sigh of relief. You okay, kid? She wiped the blood off her knife, not saying a word in response. Then she sheathed it and took a step toward me. There was a terrifying look on her face. I was sure I was about to get an earful. She cast against the goblin on the floor. 
the iron ball was deeply embedded in its skull. Blimey. Ah, that must hurt, she muttered. Then she looked back at me. Never used a morning star before, have you? Could have just easily knocked your own block off swinging it around willy nilly like that. Be more careful next time, alright? I thought she was gonna yell at me like usual, but there was something off, something nice about the way she was telling me off. <laughs> Thanks. She said softly into my ear, and I felt something warm and soft on my cheek. Oh my god, yo, we getting it. Yo! Wait a second, what's that? There's a leather bag on the ground, containing a sparkling gem. Now we're talking. Kid's face lit up with joy. Nice find, Serge, what a beaut. Kid snatched away, leaving me to settle for the compliment. I'm starting to feel a little worse for wear. I was going to have to be more careful from now on, or this was going to end badly. Not bad, Serge, not bad at all. Didn't know you had it in ya. There was a mischievous glint in Kid's eyes. She rewarded me with a few rare words of praise. Okay, we're back at this door. All right. So. I say that's where we end it for now. Thank you all for watching. And next time we'll be back with some more Radical Dreamers. Where we go check out what's behind that door. Once again, thank you to Square Enix for sponsoring this. We're going to get through this whole thing. We'll see you next time for some more, guys. Ciao.